Uh, our next speaker is Thomas Newton from McKinsey. Thomas is going to talk about uh, some of the patterns in microservices that he's going to apply to the open telecom platform. Thomas, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you for having me. Uh, undeniably, microservices are changing the way we view the world. Like I love Jason's talk on how we can take these big complex problems and, and break them down to smaller and easier to solve problems. I also love the thought of taking microservices in the mindset and scaling that across the organization and scaling teams to new unbelievable levels. But like I think a common thing today is microservices come with their own tax. Like working in a distributed system is really freaking hard. It's, uh, you know, you have to think about designing for failure. You have to think about these new architectural patterns. You have to get your developers used to these things. But what if, what if in an industry that's well regarded for its high availability and fault tolerance, they've already been working on this. And they've been working on it for 20 to 30 years. What could we get from that? What lessons could we learn? And it turns out this is true. And to do that, let's do that. Let's go on a journey. Let's go back to 1998 to see what was going on. Uh-oh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Minor interruption. Do you need to look at it? Or? Oh, there we go. OK, here we go. So we're in 1998. Uh, Monica and Bill are all over the news. Brittany introduces her first album, hits us all one more time. Titanic won like every Academy Award. Half-Life was introduced, one of my favorite games. And I had a glorious head of hair. <laughs> but more importantly, Erlang and OTP is released to open source. And Let's take a quick look at this historic announcement. Could you help me play that real quick? Declarative programming languages have several advantages over traditional languages. For example, programs in such languages are considerably shorter than the equivalent programs in imperative languages. Here, for example, is a program in C. And here is the equivalent program in Erlang. All right. So isn't that awesome? I, I just love this. It's such a classic way to introduce a language. Like, we still do this today. Uh, now, it's fair to admit that this isn't 1998. This is actually 1990. Erlang had been in development for about 10 years prior, uh, but it was just released to open source in 98. So, that's not, so we've got a good 20 to 30 years of history behind us. So exactly what is Erlang? And I think a lot of people have heard the language, but it's a, it's a functional language. And like most functional languages, it enjoys immutable data, high concurrency, uh, heavily uses pattern matching. But what makes it a little unique than other languages is in Erlang, everything's a process. And these aren't just normal processes. They're these tiny, tiny lightweight processes. And you actually write, in Erlang, you write your programs in these processes. And they stay running. So it's a little different than just using concurrency. The whole model is just like microservices. You have these small programs that talk to each other. And this, the, in Erlang, in uh, this type of concurrency, these small processes are called actors. And this is known as the actor model. So with any language that's been around this year, it's also got 30 years of tooling behind it. And you see some of these things that we're trying to do today. So for example, like with, with Erlang, you can fire up these, uh, these consoles and these dev tools. And you can see exactly how your processes are running. You can even see like, how they talk to each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can look at the messages and how they flow. You can find bottlenecks in the systems. You can look at each process and how its, how its resources are being utilized. And then what's even cooler about this is this is all exportable. So you can actually use your laptop and connect to a live production system and see all this flowing in real time to help with diagnostics and troubleshooting and support. But, and, and if you look at it, uh, uh, Erlang, a typical Erlang application in a modern microservice application, like it's the same blueprint. In fact, it, it looks so close. It's like, and 
in, a, in a Erlang and in microservices, you have a scheduler, right? You have Kubernetes or Mesos. And then same thing, you, Erlang uses a virtual machine to schedule all of its lightweight processes. They both have a registry, so you can figure out where everyone is and find them. And they both have a bunch of little actors running around doing their job. And, and I love this model. Like, if you look at this, this really embodies what you know, Sam Newman and a lot of other people in building microservices, a lot of you other people call you know, choreography over orchestration. There's no big brain in the middle of this telling everyone what to do. Everyone's just kind of working to their own dance. Erlang's a little cooler, like if one of these services crashes and falls, then another actor will come along and pick them off and dust them off and get them back to work, right? But, but the concepts are, are the same. It's like it's, it's basically microservices, but within a programming language. And these things are proven. And in fact, like today, I guarantee someone will use Erlang, right? Like you're making a phone call, sending a text message. They're, they're proven in the craziest environments in the rural, world, so these guys have really started figuring out fault tolerance and especially fault tolerance in a distributed system. In fact, WhatsApp, when it was purchased by Facebook, they, they don't really talk about this anymore after they've been purchased, but at the time of their purchase, they had 450 million users and only 10 Erlang developers. They were doing 19 billion messages in a day. And so you have in the other you know, great things, you have Couch, Rabbit, uh, Amazon SimpleDB, also all based on Erlang. So why isn't it used everywhere? Why aren't we all just Erlang developers? And the, the, you know, it's, it's a functional language, right? And like most functional languages, it has a barrier of entry, right? Like the, um, the, the, you know, there are immutable data structures, there's recursion, there's these things that it usually takes a seasoned developer to get used to. It's, you know, sometimes you're 10 years into your career before you start picking this stuff up. And then the other problem is that um, the, Erlang has kind of a bad reputation of having an obscure syntax, right? And so the famous quote in the Erlang community is, makes the hard things easy and the easy things hard. Just like a quick show of hands, like who here knows JavaScript? Uh, yeah, about, uh, near a forum conference, about what I expected. And here who is proficient in Erlang? Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's basically the problem. That's, that's why it's not everywhere. So then 2014, Elixir, you can't talk about Erlang if you don't talk about Elixir. So 2014, Elixir, fast forward, you know, uh, 1.0 and Phoenix are released. For those that don't know, Jose Valim like, takes on this challenge. He's like, I want to take this 30 years of tooling, this 30 years of hard work, but I want to make it more accessible. I want developers to get used to these things, and I want to make it easier to use. And it's inspired by a, a Ruby-like syntax. It's not a transpiler like CobbyScript. It's, it is its own language. but um, you know, it, it just makes these things easier to, to work with, and it's more geared, instead of dealing with telecom switches and messaging, it's more geared towards web, API development, things like that. And then Jose and Chris McCord uh, go on and release Phoenix, which is to help with standard web application development, socket programming, things like that. A lot more modern look, but using the same lessons from the language. And this gives a whole new next generation. So Pinterest right now is openly blogging about how they're using Elixir to help with them. They're contributing heavily to open source. And then at uh, ElixirConf this year, I saw uh, Chris, uh, sorry, Chris Bell uh, have a grill, give this like, great discussion of how they're using Elixir and the fault tolerance characteristics of Erlang to solve this like, really hard problem. They were taking these online orders from uh, from the web and trying to get those orders to these point of sale systems in these really fragile stores, right? Some of them only had a telephone line, right? So they were using principles of fault tolerance and all these things that are baked into the language to help make this a much more reliable and robust system. And then obviously you have Platform Attack and Dockyard uh, who are contributing to it. So in 2003, um, so, that, so that's enough, like that's enough of, about where it is, where it's coming from, like what can we learn from it? What can, what can we inspire us with our own microservice platforms? And I stumbled across this paper by Joe Armstrong, who's our star of our movie before and the co-creator of the language. He wrote a PhD thesis and it's called Making Reliable Distributed Systems in the Presence of Software Errors. And it's, this isn't just completely applicable to microservices today. Like, I, I don't know what is. Like, when I come across it, it's like finding the lost Dead Sea Scrolls to microservices. It was like perfect, right? So, and it's, it's really approachable. You know, I, I, I do encourage reading it. It's not like a really heavy, hard read. It is, it is easy to read. 
Um, but he outlines the nine items of the Erlang worldview. And when you read these things, it sounds like standard microservice architecture. Like it's perfect, right? So what I want to do is just take a minute, just run through some of these things, and just kind of compare and contrast where we are with Erlang and where we are today. So I kind of call this the motivational speaker, or I mean the motivational poster bit of microservices, like the kitten hanging on determination, right? So we have everything as a process. Those processes are strongly isolated. This is, this is really close to microservices today. This is, you know, basically take your big problems, break them up into small problems, isolate them from each other. Um, I think this does kind of beg the question, uh, you know, it always comes up in a microservice discussion is how big should my microservice be? Um, for me, and especially after studying Erlang and playing with the language some, you know, I, I really think in this kind of conventional wisdom, it's like the better that your, organi your organization is at handling lots of small moving parts and can do things like fault tolerance and error handling, the, better, the smaller your service can be, right? And in Erlang, they've got 20 to 30 years of experience with this. So you get these super tiny services, like nano services. They can be just a couple of lines of code, but they've gotten really good at solving this. They've gotten really good at moving all these, these, uh, these parts around. Next is processes show no resources, right? So this, is, this one's really easy, right? This is almost isomorphic to microservices. So it's like we have the common saying of one service, one database. It's the exact same thing in Erlang. If you have a process, it's running a program. That program has its own memory, its own state. It can't share. In fact, that's why the designers of the language use processes, because it makes it actually impossible to share state. The, um, and this is, uh, again, like same thing. Just prevent tight coupling, make it uh, unexpected, prevent unexpected changes from happening underneath you, those types of things. Next, we have message passing is the only way for processes to interact. Um, again, like if your, uh, if your processes or your services, if, if they are strongly isolated and they can't share resources, the only way they can you know, talk to each other is through message passing, right? Erlang will use a low latency mailbox type pattern, whereas you know, in microservices we obviously use HTTP and JSON a lot. But the concept is, is basically the same. Uh, the next one is process creation and destruction is lightweight. So uh, Joe Armstrong, again, in some of his talks, he'll go on to say that a Erlang process is so lightweight as compared to an operating system process like a grain of sand to a boulder. Right? And I, I just love this visualization. It's right, like sand is easy to move around. It's malleable. You can do lots of things with it. You can spread it across lots of surfaces. Right? A boulder is hard. Right? I got to move this big thing around. Right? And, and this, this inspiration you see even following in, in microservices today, right? Like Docker is a great start to all this. <laughs> like Docker lets you package it up and you can move it and ship it. It's like great for our schedulers. And it's certainly a lot better than the mountain sized servers that we used to deal with. But it's still a long way to go, right? The lighter we can get these things, the better we'll be able to work with them, the better we'll be able to use them in our microservice platforms. And, and so when I saw the announcement that Docker bought unikernel systems, like this is even, like, it's like it starts all coming together. It's like this is even better, right? Like this container sizes are getting smaller. You know, maybe we'll at least get down to boulder size and that'll at least, we can at least move things around a little bit better that way. And then, then uh, okay, there we go, okay. Processes have unique names and if you know the name of the process, you can call it. And again, like this is super straightforward in, in Erlang and Elixir. Whenever you create a process with your code that's running in it, whenever you have your program, all you have to do is it generates a PID. And as long as you know that PID, you can just call it. It can be on this machine. It can be on a machine in another part of the world. It doesn't matter. It's like all you need to know is the name or the PID, and you're good to go. And in microservices space, like I still feel like we're making a lot of traction here, but we still have a long way to go, right? We have we have, it, it mainly just because it's so confusing. Like we have great products like etcd and console and zookeeper to help us keep track of all these services. And then we have other great products to help us figure out how to route the traffic between them. But trying to put it all together in your own platform, and this is like what's great about like talking about PaaS and stuff like that to help make some of these decisions for us. But putting it all together right now is just extremely confusing and a lot of overhead and a lot of thinking that needs to go into it. And the next is processes do what they're supposed to do or fail. And then uh, in Erlang, they'll call this programming with intent um, or let it crash is another uh, common word that's used for it. And I've also heard let it die in microservices. But you know, the, the idea is 
really focus on the logic of what you're working on, right? So like don't overdo it with trying to imagine every possible error case. Like just program with intent. Your code has just what it needs to do to solve the business problem. And then if it can't do what it can do, it, it, what does it do? It crashes. It just dies. Like do what you need to do or just die. And in fact, in Erlang, the compiler is optimized for this. You don't, you'll see they use pattern matching very heavily to figure this out. So you'll see, like, do this, do this, and if it doesn't match the pattern, the thing will just die, right? And then well, what happens when you die? Like, you can't just let it die, right? And so that's the concept behind error handling is non-local. And so what you'll do here is when you die, you make a phone call and you call your supervisor. And your supervisor comes to the job, he dusts you off, he helps get you started back. He, he may restart you. He has all these strategies. He has a message that's sent to him that has what went wrong and why. And then he can use that data as a separate program to figure out what to do to get the, uh, to get the original worker back to his job, right? And this is the whole concept. If you've heard, if you've played around with Elixir Erlang and you've seen uh, what, or heard people call supervision trees, that's basically the concept here is you'll have a supervisor who's watching workers and he gets them back to work if they happen to crash or die. But, but there's a strong link between them. And, that, and in the tooling example I was showing before, that's how you get those visualizations and those diagrams. And you can watch the message flows. You build this architecture and this topology of fault tolerance, right? And you have supervisors, and you completely separate those concerns. And, and that's it. That's what I have for today. So I, I guess anything is like if I'm saying if, uh, if you're looking at how to solve these big problems and you want to do this, like look at some of these languages. Look at languages that can support things like the actor model. Like let's take those patterns from the past and see how we can apply them to our microservice architecture today. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you today at, uh, at Microservices Day. <laughs>